Hi, greetings to you in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm just sorry I'm not with you today. And I take great pleasure in talking to you about my views on global consumer trends, implications for the poultry and egg industry worldwide. I like to start in a sort of a real global world. And typically, if I'm in front of you, I ask, how many people do we have in this world? And of course, you, educated as you are, you'll know that it's 7.8 billion. Well, is that a lot? That's 7,800 million people. It's a lot to me because, what, 47, 47 years ago, I emigrated to Canada as a food policy analyst. And then in 1973, August 1973, the population of the world was 3.8 billion. So over the last close to 50 years, the population of the world has more than doubled and we've coped. Why do I say that? Because back in 73, the prevailing view was that actually we wouldn't cope, that there wouldn't be enough food, that, that Malthus was right, that there would be widespread starvation. That hasn't happened, frankly. And indeed, there's still a disproportional amount of people who wake up hungry and go to bed hungry, 800 million of them, but that proportion has gone down and down and down and down. So here we are in 2020 at about 7.8 billion, and we're going to add another 2 billion over the next 20, 30 years, as you can see from this slide. And are we going to spread that 2 billion just evenly out across our world? Not at all. If you notice, and we all know, actually the world is becoming increasingly African and Asian. But far and away by 2050, they will have the, the largest proportion of this globe. So of those 2 billion, 1 billion over the next 20 years or so will be added to Africa. That's doubling the population of Africa. Uh, I'm very Africa positive, but uh, I ask the question, is that a sort of brilliant food marketing opportunity for us? Or is it more a sort of social problem or perhaps some combination of both? And again, it's not controversial to say this, but of the extra 2 billion we're going to add, 1.5 billion will either be of the Muslim or the Hindi uh, religion. Uh, so what? Actually, as it turns out, that's particularly good news for those who are in the chicken and egg business. And it's probably less good news for those in the hog, the pig business, and indeed the beef business. What about the domestic market? Here we are in Atlanta. If I look at NAFTA that was, but the US, Canada, and Mexico, uh, you've got a population roughly of about 500 million in those three countries. And over the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to add an extra 100 million. That's brilliant from a domestic marketing point of view. I'm speaking to you from Europe and the EU, and let's count the UK in the UK, in the EU for the moment, although we won't be for long, actually the population of Europe is sliding quietly backwards. But not as much as, for example, in Japan, where with a population of 126 million, each year the Japanese government estimate the population will decline by 1 million. Is that good news if you're in the food business or any business for that matter? I suggest no. It's getting smaller and smaller. That's why I see around the world Japanese food firms looking to buy, to acquire companies in higher growth markets. But here's an interesting uh, graph in itself too. It's the median age of continents. So that's the age in the middle, where there's as many people on the right-hand side as there are on the left-hand side. And what is astonishing is the median age of Africa. It's 18. 18, 1, 8, compared with, say, in Europe, 42, or aging Japan, as I've already mentioned, 47. In North America, uh, actually, it's 35, but that includes Mexico. Uh, the US is close to 40, Canada something just over 40. But so what? Well, what it suggests is from an African perspective, if we see good economic development in that continent, then they certainly have lots of young labor coming into the workforce, which is something that we certainly can't say in Europe, and certainly can't say in North America. But on the other hand, if there's a problem, if economics, if we don't see that growth in economic development, then there may be trouble ahead. And so without being negative here, uh, if it's slow economic growth, we're going to see a fair proportion of that extra billion saying, we want work and we're willing to walk to find that work. And so if we think we've had an immigration crisis in Europe or indeed in North America uh, over the last 10 years, then I think we have to think again because there will be problems. Moving on. I mean, what's intriguing is as we add these 2 billion, as we move towards 10 billion total population, then many 
of those extra people will be in large cities. We're already largely industrialized, but not in emerging countries. And we tend to focus on countries, specifically countries. There's about 196 countries, and trade talks are always between countries. But actually, what I see emerging more are mega cities, 600 mega cities becoming the key food markets. These are cities of the size of, uh, of Shanghai, we we'll say 30, or let's go to Jakarta in, uh, in Indonesia. Mexico City itself, well over 20 million. And it's intriguing. Look to the top right there. There's a couple you might know. Every year, Bill and Melinda Gates write a letter to the world, and they've always got something to say. Actually, it normally arrives in February. It's rather late for a Christmas card. And what they said last year is that if you look at the pace of industrialization and urbanization, it's essentially the same as us building an entire New York City every month for the next 40 years. So what? Well, from an agricultural point of view, it suggests to me that as the cities don't just go vertical, they also go horizontal, that we're going to be sapping away at arable land around the world and we're short of it already. And so I think this sort of continued industrialization and urbanization is going to just suck up arable land and make the point that if you're in farming, you want to hang on to that farm. Moving on. Actually, another thing associated with urbanization is urban agriculture. Now, whether this has any notion at all, per se, poultry and eggs, I'm not quite sure. But it's certainly having an impact in, its, in a modest way in, say, salad crop production, where we see vertical farms springing up around some major cities, particularly major cities uh, in uh, developed countries, the so-called uh, higher, higher income countries. And who's behind this? Well, actually, again, it's intriguing. Uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, the principal of Amazon, is a major investor in urban agriculture. And so is the guy on the left, who is the brother of the Tesla Musk guy. This is Kimball Musk, and he's heavy into it too. I put it up just for your consideration. Again, whether in fact we'll see any movement towards within peri-urban, within uh, city production of chicken and eggs is another matter but it's something for consideration. Moving on. Look, last year in the middle of the year, 2019, this came out from the Food and Agriculture Organization, and it is a map of the world with FAO's best estimate of what might happen around the globe by 2050 as a result of climate change. And what it says, if you're green or even dark green, then that may be sort of neutral or perhaps even vaguely positive with climate change. And so, for example, I note, I'm a Canadian as well as a Brit, but Canada is the only country with darkish green. And what it's saying there is a little bit of global warming in Canada actually can have a positive impact on agriculture in the prairies, for example, where they can be just much more productive. But why I show you this is the pink and the ready bits are the bits to worry about because that's where climate change can have a real negative impact. And I can't help noticing that it's that area which is also going to see the population increase. So it's a reminder to me that we may have food security problems emerging over the next 20 or 30 years, but it will also give particularly strong food export marketing opportunities for those in the greener areas focused on the pink and red areas. And on the right there, what do we see is, it, I find that this frightening, it's the average global sea level rise over the last, give or take, 25 years. Now, globally, the sea level has risen by about 10 centimeters. Doesn't seem a lot, but if you are close to or on the water, and I would remind you that most of the big cities of the world are on the water, uh, then we may, we may, if you use the expression, we may have to call the Dutch it because there's gonna be problems. Take, for example, Bangladesh. So just look to the right-hand side of, uh, of, of India. I mean, there's a relatively small country, same size as Wisconsin geographically, uh, with a population of close to 170 million, and about a third of the population are at or below sea level. What I said again, there may be trouble ahead uh, because they, will they won't drown, they'll walk. And then again, I think we have to just be more sort of grown up about our view of immigration crises. This isn't a Bangladesh problem, it's a global problem. How are we going to place these people? We're not going to just allow them to sit and die.
And it's this sort of green area uh, that I wanted to sort of develop a little further. And we've just gone past the week of Davos, uh, put on by the World Economic Forum. And I've been sort of following whatever their outpourings are over the last 10 years. And what do they think are the big risks to look at over the next 10 years? Well, actually, increasingly, the risks that they consider really important from a business perspective relate to the environment. Yes, economics are important, but look here. Long-term risk outlook, it's about extreme weather, climate action failure, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, human-made environmental disasters. Uh, yes, there are other things, cyber attacks, etc. but the big deal ones and the longer-term ones relate to the environment. So, again, finishing off this little tiny section of what I want to say, back to Africa and this need to really increase food production uh, within that huge continent. I mean, what we can see here on the left-hand side is that if we take uh, maize or corn, for example, that actually corn productivity performance, maize productivity performance in Africa is very poor. This has to change. And we're probably going to need every tool in the box to ensure that it does change. But on the right-hand side, what's my point? That, look, in my line of work, I've got to read a lot. I read for everybody else. And what I notice is that in some of the great periodicals of the world the, for example the economist which is like my comic on a saturday morning uh, so it's read right around the world five years ago you'd never see anything about agriculture now there are lead stories on agriculture becoming increasingly common in not only the economist the new york times etc and it's just a reminder to me that the whole view the global view on agriculture has moved up it's not that agriculture has become more fashionable i think its relative importance is being understood more and so for us in agriculture and food i think that's i mean there are you know we've got to be careful here because it's it's hitting the headlines because of disasters of pers pers prospective disasters but actually it means that we are a much higher profile moving on okay I just want to talk quickly about protein. You're in the protein business. If you're in eggs and, and, and broilers, chickens, poultry, you're into, into protein. And I refer to it as the protein umbrella because from a consumer perspective, I just see the consumer's view of, of what is protein has just grown and grown and grown. Again, from a Western economy point of view in history, protein was the center of the plate. It was meat, but increasingly, within our own economies, we're seeing protein be much more than that. It's dairy protein, it's plant protein. But actually, if you take a look at this just quick diagram on the left-hand side here, what it tells you is that for the last 20, 30, for time immemorial, actually plant protein has been the most important protein in our world. Demand for protein overall is increasing, but this is good news, but in particular, demand for meat eggs and dairy protein is in very, very healthy growth. Plant protein is growing, but not at the same rate, same rate as uh, for, for, for meat, eggs, etc. protein. And if I go down further, let's have a look at what Rabobank is saying. Worldwide, 35% more demand for animal protein in the next 20 years. That's a huge move forward. Why I mention it is because if you sit in, again, developed economies in the Western world and read the papers, read the media, it seems that we're suddenly all turning into vegans, into vegetarians. Of course, that isn't the case. Uh, and that just this protein umbrella is growing and growing and growing. OK, moving to sort of consumer trends, if you will. To my mind, probably the most influential and we're all aware of it, even if it's just in the backs of our mind, is this increasing move towards the notion of climate-friendly diets. It's gaining substantial traction. Who's pushing it? Well, the people you can see on your screen are pushing it. And not least, for example, top right there, the precocious and very influential Greta. I mean, she can be a little irritating every now and again, but my word, has she made an impact all the way from Sweden and age 16. So the kids of the world are saying, hey, climate change is happening. We have to do something about it. And it includes all sorts of action. Listen to them. This isn't Scotch mist, as we say in the UK. It's real. Just look in your own families. Talk to your own sons and daughters or to your grandchildren and find out. And which is exactly what I do. 
I mean, I know that, and these are the people you've got to watch. They're, they're a menace, they're a nightmare. Uh, the one on the top there is Scarlett, a grandchild of mine. And if I look at uh, her, uh, the, the comic that she gets, her paper, her newspaper that she gets weekly, what's the headlines? Are your trainers costing the earth? Uh, the one down the right, Seraphine, it, 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 she's a nightmare. I can't buy anything uh, for that family because she wants to know exactly who produced it. How did they produce it? Where did it come from? Where did the feed come from? No, it's frightening. Is it just kids who are pushing this climate friendly uh, agenda? Not at all. It's their grandparents. Look, here's the United Nations. Plant-based diets, key in tackling climate change, UN report warns. Food systems must undergo significant change. Davos last week, headlines on the first day. 2020 urges dietary change, sustainable supply chains and agri-food system transformation. And then just last week in the UK, uh, the UK government, its own reporting, came out with cut meat and dairy intake by a fifth. Actually, that may think, mm -mm, but really what they're saying is people should cut the amount of beef, lamb and dairy products they eat by a fifth to combat climate change, a report says, and a very influential report. So does this mean, as I said, that we're all turning vegetarian? Not at all. Let's look at the, uh, the US. Eating meat is clearly still the norm. But flexitarian and vegan vegetarian eating is increasing and it's skewed towards younger shoppers. So what are these flexitarians? Flexitarians are those who like meat, but they're considering eating less meat and maybe putting a better balance with more plant-based uh, foods into, into their diets. I mean, the brilliant thing is when they eat less meat, they actually want to eat better meat. And that's a real opportunity in the premium end for meat, whether it be red meat or white meat in many countries, moving on. But if I go to Europe, actually meat eating frequency and meat eating per capita consumption is declining in most countries. You can see it here for Spain, for France, for the, uh, for the UK. Slowly, slowly, per capita consumption tends to be drifting down. But actually, again, it tends to be for red meat. I look in my own country that chicken, which is the most frequently consumed meat in the UK, is still increasing. And indeed, egg consumption is having boom times. And so why are people saying they'd like to eat less meat? Actually, wherever I look across particularly higher income countries, the same story comes out. And I've just taken some more recent research here from Australia. Health, that is People's health is the number one reason why Australians, but also the UK, also French, are choosing to eat less meat. Closely followed by a four-way tie, the environment, animal welfare, the cost of, uh, of meat, you know, particularly red meat at the top end is very expensive. And then there's a better variety of plant-based uh, uh, options available. You could just replicate this research in many, many countries. And so, again, back to those children. Those children are saying, what are we doing about climate change? Should we change our diets? Uh, I take something here from the BBC uh, uh, website online in the UK. And this is a little toy, which is uh, uh, much used in, in schools. How do your food choices impact on the environment? So in this particular case, on the left-hand side, I said, OK, let's say I had beef twice a week. What would be its environmental impact? Over an entire year, your consumption of beef is contributing 604 kg to your annual greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, but what if I just had chicken twice a week? What would impact would that have? It would be about a sixth of that impact at 106 kg. And what about eggs? Actually, substantially less, less again. So what do we see? That as consumers get increasingly uh, concerned about the environmental impact, red meat in particular takes a big hit. Uh, I don't think chicken is out of the woods, if you uh, allow me to use that expression, but, uh, but still it is substantially less. Actually, the focus is on vegetarian-based products. So peas, if you were dull enough to want to eat peas all week, uh, have almost no impact from a greenhouse gas emission perspective. Okay, how do proteins compare? Again, back to the BBC website, you can see beef is seen as a villain, whether it should be or not is another matter. Uh, and then about halfway down is chicken and to a lesser extent eggs. And again, you can see beans, peas, nuts, those sort of self-righteous vegetarian products look particularly well. But chicken and eggs relatively well placed on greenhouse gas emissions. 
Okay, so what's happened in the marketplace? And let's take a quick look at this plant-based stuff. I can do this quickly, but this is all last year. Uh, why I put it up is that when I'm talking around the world about plant-based meat uh, eating, uh, I often get told, yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's only fashionable, it's only popular with um, over-educated urban elite. Well, I don't think so. I think it's in the mainstream. And that's reflected if you look at what's happened to fast food around the world in the last 12 months. So here we go. Frantic plant-based activity in the world in 2019. Here's Carl Jr. with its Vegan Beyond Burger. You'll have to be quick to catch up with me here. Here's A&W with its Beyond Meat Burger right across North America. Here we are with McDonald's in Germany with its Big Vegan Burger. And who's making the burger? Oh, it's Nestle, not some Mickey Mouse little guy. Uh, here we are, Canada, with McDonald's tasting its PLT. What's a PLT? Plant, lettuce, and tomato burger. Uh, the Impossible Whopper in uh, the US. 100% Whopper, no percent beef. Let's go to Europe for the Rebel Whopper, which is the Burger King equivalent uh, in, in Europe. And it's produced by Unilever. Again, 100% Whopper, no beef. Unilever producing. So Nestle and Unilever are into this right up to their necks. Even the Colonel has gone chickenless. Good Lord. Here we are testing out uh, chickenless nuggets or uh, the original recipe for the vegan burger, the chicken like burger. Uh, and what do they use? They use corn. I'll come back to corn in a minute. New meaty vegan garlic wrap at Subway in the UK. Here I am in Canada. I was there two weeks ago with uh, Beyond Meat launching its new plant-based Beyond Meat Wall uh, in Subway once again. Uh, McDonald's joins the veganery craze. This is the first ever vegetarian happy meal for children, hugely successful in the UK. And Pizza Hut testing plant-based incognito sausage toppings uh, in their round boxes. And who's making the incognito? It's Kellogg's. Kellogg's? I thought they did breakfast cereals. Duncan. Great taste, plant-based, again, whoops. And is this only North America, Europe? Not at all. I mean, oh my God, even in Australia. The Australians eat as much red meat as the US, which is a phenomenal amount. And that trend, that full-on plant-based trend is just as evident there. So, but look at this, this sort of really intrigues me. And I think if we're in the chicken and egg industry, we have to take note here. So Unilever, go back to 2018, they buy the Vegetarian Butcher, which is a plant-based food startup out of the Netherlands. They bring it to the UK. And this last quarter, the last quarter of 2019, they put $10 million spend behind the Vegetarian Butcher products to give them a little push in the market. When did we in chicken and eggs ever spend that amount of money on promotion? We tend to focus our promotion on price. And what's more, and I think this is, we have to watch it because it can be extraordinarily competitive. Here's the vegetarian butcher products. They're sort of a little naughty, but they're pretty cool. What the cluck, chicken out burger. And then here we are, it's a bit schoolboyish, little peckers and little willies. And I ask, are they out chickening chicken? I look at those products and think they're damn good products. They're very consumer cool. And I think that serious competition for us. Is it just in chicken itself? No, of course, it's plant-based in mayonnaise. Here's Hellman's, which is Unilever with its vegan mayo. Here's not, as in not mayo, out of Spain. And uh, just, which is, sort of, is better known in the, uh, in, in the US, made with mung beans, just eggs. It's just hit Kroger shelves in the US. So it's going mainstream, I would suggest. Whole Foods add plant-based eggs to its hot bars. So Food to Go has now got the egg-like products. So they're, they're real, they're in the marketplace. Plant-based egg alternative just builds European network with PHW. So in one of the, the bigger meat companies uh, and egg companies in, uh, in, in, in Europe. That's again back from last year. And here we are with Renmatix, simple seller, egg replacement ingredient expansion. And Renmatix forms a US distribution agreement with the ingredient house. And so the view is that egg replacements, uh, why are they better than eggs? Price is more stable. And anyway, plant-based demand is buoyant. No, they're a threat, got to accept it. And so who's pushing plant-based in the UK apart from the media? Well, I can assure you it's also retail. 
And why are they doing it? Because it just shoots off their shelves. Here's Tesco, which is our like Kroger equivalent, if you will, in the, in, in, in the UK, with Wicked, which is a premium plant-based offer. And they had to bring in Plant Chef at a lower price point because the lower income people say, hey, we want that plant-based uh, offer. So no, there's, for food overall, last year, Tesco saw sales increases of less than 2%. For plant-based products, it was between 16 and 20 percent. They're giving it space on the shelves because it's selling, and therefore it's a threat. Same thing happening in the U.S. I would suggest Kroger debuts plant-based fresh meat brand. Uh, this is what two weeks ago. Here we go. And again, if we go into the new year in the U.K., uh, what is popular here has become uh, very fashionable is to be vegan, vegan for the month. And so most of the major Companies here's Asda, which is our Walmart equivalent, launching 48 new vegan plant-based products in January. Uh, but actually, a lot of the activity on plant-based is outside regular grocery retail. And I think where we've seen a real push in uh, my country in the UK is in food to go. And I look at food to go specialists who are better at doing food to go than traditional supermarkets. Here's Pret a manger, Pret as we know it, uh, who've now opened up veggie Prets. And as they point out, not just for veggies, it's for people who like good plant based foods. I was visiting one, you can see me with the red hat here just before Christmas, uh, looking to see if I could spot uh, open toed sandal, long haired, whimsy, whimsical, bearded folk in there. No, regular business people who just want a different sort of lunch every now and again. Wagamama, which is another food to go place. And look at on the right hand side, a mind blowing vegan egg dish by a celebrity chef, again launched at the back end of last year. Is it just a European or North American thing? Not at all. I see mock meat just starting to get some traction to in, in Asia. Just watch out. And you know, let's remember that who's into this business? Who's into plant based meats? Certainly every big meat company and also every major big food company. Here's just a few and all the names we know. It's the, as I said, the Unilever's, the Nestle and the Kellogg's, but every one of the major global meat players, whether it be JBS, Marfig, Cargill, Tyson, Smithfield, WH Group, of course, uh, PHW in, uh, uh, in Europe, Danish Crown, etc. They're all into it and they're into it because they see opportunities. I think probably the best meat mimic and maybe the best chicken mimic comes from corn. Corn, which is owned, as you'll know, by Monde Nissin out of the Philippines. It will be the first one billion dollar brand uh, and it's an excellent chicken mimic. It mimics a lot of things well. And here's just a selection of their products. Some of them like chicken free slices, but they also do fishless fingers, uh, for goodness sake. But um, crunchy Tex-Mex nuggets, good products which are selling well around the world. A major reason why people are electing to go meat less every now and again is because the opportunity to eat decent vegetable, vegetarian based foods has just grown. For somebody my age, if you were a vegetarian, which I wasn't in the 1970s, it was a hair shirt. It was just dreadful. You had to have some gritty soy burger or some, some, some a, a, a appalling nut roast. Now, if I look at the products I see on the shelves, you think, hmm, they look really yummy. I think I'll, every now and again I'll, I'll throw in a lunch on a Wednesday, which is plant-based. Why not? And I haven't even have time and don't have the time to talk about cultured meats. But again, there is still a lot of oomph in here. And for example, uh, just a matter of weeks ago, actually, Memphis Meats raised 161 million uh, from venture capitalists, and it's the same names keep coming up. It's the Tysons and the Cargills are into this, as well as full-blown venture capitalists. I would expect, maybe not in my professional lifetime, but I would be astonished if these didn't have tra traction over, say, a 10-year period. Here we go again, Memphis with its good-looking uh, products. And slaughter-free is the future, is it? Who knows? Bit difficult for you to see maybe this, but I couldn't help thinking that if you went back to the 1960s, what was the minor meat in the US? The minor meat was chicken. And it's been a phenomenal success over the last 60 years. 
and you can see just stellar moving straight up whereas beef for example uh, moving down from uh, I mean, substantially down over that same period and what underpins chicken success affordable tasty healthy nutritious convenient versatile kids like widely available it's consumer focused and it's efficient to produce so what do i think is going to happen to plant-based products which might be competing with chicken i think they will have their place in the market the proportion of the market they have they will have in 10 or 15 years time will depend on the degree to which they can emulate chicken success if they're affordable if they're tasty healthy nutritious convenient versatile if kids like them if they're widely available if as they are already consumer focused and if they are more efficient in their production then they will sell and it's just a matter of what proportion of that market will have so that protein umbrella that i talk about is just getting bigger in 10 years time or more plant-based will have its place in our markets and the matter is will that be five percent or will it be 25 percent i would suggest moving on and look the food revolution to drive plant-based segment to 85 billion who's saying this is this some special interest group uh who's got animal welfare uh, as its major push no it's a conservative swiss bank ubs uh, they're saying and i just noticed that that the investment community are waking up to this and they believe it's going to happen okay quickly what about some other consumer trends and uh, these are ones that have been you know forever with us in many respects first of all look people are running out of time we're all time optimizers and actually we want convenience and actually what is convenience about well actually convenient is convenient to buy convenient to prepare convenient to consume convenient to dispose and look convenience trumps health what do i mean by that you can have the healthiest product in the world but if it's not convenient people will not buy it so time optimizers really important we are getting much more health conscious i'll come on to that we want more individual offers recognize me as an individual i've got very specific requirements cater for me people are more experimental and certainly they're more socially conscious and part of this convenience one is this snackification of eating there's a veritable tsunami of protein snacks coming on the market so if you talk again particularly to those under 40 you know millennials and uh, gen z's as they're referred to that if you say when do you eat they say well i eat when i'm when I'm hungry, you know, when I'm hungry. Uh, do you have three meals a day? No, I, eat, I might have a mini meal or I might have a snack, but the snack could be a healthy snack. I think we were rather late getting into this in the, uh, in the meat and egg business, but we're now at it at, at pace. And what's more, the big players are here too. So here we are with Kellogg's. I put up the RX bar, which they bought as a startup, if you will, and it's been very successful. Them. And here they are, and it's, it, it identifies nicely what people want, they want, few natural ingredients that they can pronounce so the rx bar here with three egg whites six almonds four cashews two dates no bullshit so that's kellogg's effort here we go back into meat uh fridge raiders powered by protein so slow roasted chicken bites very tasty eat them on the run etc uh from moy park out of uh, northern ireland in the uk pow zap you can see exactly that they're focused at children if you were protein power barbecue chicken wings from the u.s farm rich with its timeouts fiesta chicken roll-ups etc great looking food on the run and here is that well, terrific company cp out of thailand with its grabbits which are sold in the in the uk a grabbits on fire so chicken on a stick if you will here's corn with its chicken bites uh, which may raise your ire and they may well have to change that nomenclature because it's a little more than cheeky that the core that even put chick into it for goodness sake tyson of course into all sorts of snacks that relate to chicken and i do a lot of work in thailand and when i'm at, in 7-eleven there i just i'm always i think my word what a job they do 7-eleven the franchise in thailand owned by cp cp produce the chicken feed the chickens the chicken meat the processed chickens, the chicken snacks, and then sell it in 7-Eleven stores for which they own the franchise. They've got you know, a complete run through the supply chain. So owning the supply chain from livestock feed through to retail shelf with meal and snack solutions. 
what about eggs? Let's say something about eggs. Kraft Heinz joins the breakfast club with or Ida's just crack an egg. I love love this idea. Actually, we, we don't really get this in the UK. I don't think we understand it. Ready egg go, again, good egg snacks. The omelette bar, ready to eat and keto friendly, so on trend from a dietary perspective. And then with Jimmy Dean from the Tyson stable with simple scrambles, etc. cetera. I mean, good products to meet uh, contemporary consumer requirements. But when I look at what's happening with eggs, actually, I always think of Asia. Asia loves eggs and knows how to actually merchandise eggs so much better than we do. The egg category, the egg department, if you will, in supermarkets is always a lot more exciting in Asia than it is in the US or in Europe or Canada. Uh, Dr. Egg, here we are again in Thailand with a, uh, uh, a fast egg chain. Love it, an egg cake. We've got a lot to learn in eggs when a visit to Asia. But mind you, and I love this too, just it's a throwaway one really. Simple is, as simple does, as Forrest Gump's mama used to say. And it's a great way to leverage egg protein attributes. Just put an egg on it. I'm a co-owner of a restaurant and uh, I, I'm always delighted to see that if we produce something, particularly which is say lunchy and fast, and then just say, would you like an egg on it? People say, yeah, put an egg on it. That's a great way to up the effort on egg sales. Okay, what about eggs and chicken on health? Well, actually we've got the wind behind us in this regard. Almost every department of health that I ever see around the world, and particularly in higher income countries, is stressing that we need to reduce meat consumption and actually what the the subtext is to reduce red meat consumption so here's the eat well live well plate out of canada do you think the red meat the livestock and meat guys are well pleased just look at that plate top right you can just about spot the red meat it's that little dot at the top uh, luckily there's chicken and, uh, and eggs there think about dairy Make water your drink of choice, not milk your drink of choice. So that's in Canada. Move on to the healthy eating plate in the US. The right hand side is the official choosemyplate.gov saying it should be a combination of half your intake fruit and veg and the other half grains and protein, not specifying what the protein should do. But actually, if you go to Harvard Medical School and look at their healthy eating plate, then they underline the food politics of plates. What do they say about healthy protein? Choose fish, poultry, beans and nuts. Limit red meat and cheese. Avoid bacon, cold cuts and other processed meats. So there's a huge political element to, to this. It's whether the Department of Health in the, in the respective countries has the political will to actually say what they want to say or to be influenced uh, by pressure groups. Here's Belgium. Uh, moves processed meats off its food pyramid uh, you won't be as strong in the language uh, as I am, no doubt. But here we are just saying there's more, less, and then the red dot down the bottom is none at all. Um, where do you come in? Where does eggs and chicken come in? You come in the bottom end of more. But if you're into the red dot, that's uh, cut out altogether. Bacon, salamis, uh, pizza. Oh, and dear God, even wine and beer. That's not going to go. Okay, so how do we stand uh, globally on health? Let's take, for example, eggs. Well, I'm never quite sure because if I look at egg consumption in general around the world, given the work that I do with the International Egg Organization, in most countries you can see that it's buoyant. But actually, consumers are still a little concerned about eggs. Uh, and the BBC did a piece of research looking, what does the evidence say out there? And their conclusion was, that the evidence is inconclusive, that on the one hand you can eat more eggs, on the other you have to be more careful. So are eggs helpful to our health or a cause of heart disease? And people still don't really know. So we've got a job to do in pushing the healthiness of that product. And again, it doesn't help that every now and again, egg com contamination scandals just sort of blow up. And we think, uh oh, maybe we should cut back uh, because there may be a personal health scare. And then don't forget too that the Animal welfare guys, they're zealous, they're relentless, and they're well financed. PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, is a really good example here. And just is from the subway system, the tube as we call it, in, in London. Sort of interest, I'm me, not me, trying to relate the animal 
to the meat that you have on the plate and you can see I'm me not meat in the hen just in the background there. And then also sometimes I think we shoot ourselves in the foot. A German grocery chain is now selling first of its kind no-kill eggs that don't tell consumers that male chicks are routinely destroyed at birth. They might consider this to be barbaric behavior. Get ahead of the curd and fix it. We can now fix that with technology. What about some big trends? Here we go. Storytelling, willing with words. This is Innova Market Insights. I like what they come out with. This is their 2020 number one trend. And what do they what do they say? Why do you want to send to consumers? Why do you want to know the story behind the food and drinks that you buy? Well, we want to learn where the ingredients come from. Who produced it? How did they produce it? I think that's a brilliant opportunity for us if we have a good story to tell and nothing to hide. Number two, the plant-based revolution. I've already well covered that. Trend three is this whole area of sustainability, and I'll come back to that. A lot of it relates to, say, plastic waste, food waste, but there's more to it, and I will soon. And in this sort of world of health, there's a lot happening. I think we're really moving, consumers are moving from pills, from reactive preventative health, towards more natural health. Say, what can I do through diet, exercise, and lifestyle to improve my health? because I don't want this reliance on pills and I don't believe the health system has got the oomph in it to look after me. And what we see is that food products will be tailored to meet personal dietary priorities. Because what I see is that, again, particularly for higher income people, that they'll say, what sort of person do I want to be? Do I want to be like a physically fit, big muscle guy? I'll have this diet. Do I want to feel more good about myself? Perhaps I'm overweight, I'll have this diet. Do I want a more sort of ooh, zen lifestyle? Then I'll have this diet. Uh, do I have a particular health problem, like a heart problem? Then I'll have this diet. And what's more, we'll start to use technology to help us take the right decisions, or in our mind's eye, the right decisions about what food. And here I've taken, I represent Imperial College. I'm pleased to have their label. And a fellow professor, Chris Tomazu, has launched DNA Nudge, which is a little tool uh, which is a bit like the mouse that you use with a computer. But what you do is take one of the swabs that you clean your ears with and put it once around your mouth, push it in his, to his DNA nudge, and it does a reading, if you will, of your DNA. Then when you are purchasing food through set retailers, it's just been tested now, you just take your DNA nudge and you zap it against the UPC code of the food product. Beep! And it gives you a reading on whether that food product is good for you or maybe a little less good for you. Uh, down the bottom end, there's me again, uh, outside the DNA Nudge pop-up store in this very, very center of London. This is high rental district. Uh, will we see more of this? We'll see lots more. Do you have that in the US? Yes, you do at the moment, and it's just growing. And I think what we have to watch here from a, 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 a food industry point of view is that increasingly, I see on health, we're going to have to be quite clear what is the impact of this product on the consumer's health. In Europe, they're moving towards this sort of uh, more generic Nutri-Score. And uh, Danone, Nestle, for example, big food firms are saying, yes, we'll run with it. So we've already got that to a degree, but what is coming our way, and it's coming our way big time, is EnviroScores. And I would suggest over the next two or three years that there will be a push by the food industry, believe it or not, and also a push by government to have on each food product a score relating to its environmental impact. It could be, for example, its, its carbon score, for example. And I just wonder, is that a threat or is that a real opportunity for poultry and eggs as we tend to score quite well on environmental related issues? It's coming our way. You know, is it going to be from an environmental, are you on the bon, good, or the mauvais, no, worse side of the equation. I think actually poultry and eggs can be on the best side of the equation. And this is already happening. In, uh, again, in the UK, Tesco, the number one retailer, and WWF, the panda lady, uh, are launching a green food metric on some of the private label products. And corn, which is a great chicken mimic, is already doing it with its carbon uh, score as indeed Oatly, which is a plant-based, so oat-based uh, uh, drink, milk-type drink. It's happening, and it's coming our way in a hurry.
here, you'll have to just stretch yourself here, but I, there's some really interesting market research from Kantar, which is looking at across the world, unfortunately the US and Canada isn't in here because they haven't finished the research on it, but for many countries represented here, what they notice is that increasingly a proportion of consumers, who they call eco-actives, are taking decisions on what they buy in supermarkets on the basis of their perception of what is the impact of this food product on the environment, on animal welfare, on farmers, on their local economy, etc. And what we see in Europe is roughly 20% of consumers are eco, are actively eco-active. Uh, now, what they notice too, and it's not surprising, it's just commonsensical, that the degree to which you're eco-active is linked very much to your income, so GDP per capita. And so the higher income the countries, the more likely you'll have more eco-actives. So in Europe, it's Austria and Germany that far and away the most eco-active. And I don't find that surprising. For example, in Austria, close to 18.18% of food that's purchased is organic. Germany is less, but still very high. In the UK, we're still at two to three percent of food is organic. In the US, it might be seven percent is organic. And, and there's a distinct correlation between the, the, the degree to which people are willing to pay more for organic and the degree to which they will also be eco-active in all sorts of areas. And we can see it in this sort of consumer push against plastic. Uh, so France to tax non-recycled plastic packaging, for example, last year. Here we are, here's Nestle, one of the biggest food companies, the biggest food company in the world, and one of the biggest confectionery companies, uh, with Nestle backs, yes, snack bars, with a huge TV push, and a large part of the, you see down the bottom of the ad, one of the first brands to make a difference in the snack category with a recyclable paper wrapper. Believe it or not, up to now, most confectionery items are in packaging which is not recyclable. You might ask the question, why has it taken so long for Nestle to get here? But once they get here, they get here big time. Here they're spending up to two billion on recycled plastic plan uh, that they announced this two weeks ago. How is it going to hit us? Well, egg cartons are the next packaging to be replaced by reusable containers, say Pete and Jerry's organic eggs. And, you know, and good on them. And you can see it coming. Uh, for chicken, it's going to be much more the emphasis on uh, how do we package that, that, that product. A couple of years ago, no, about 18 months ago, I was working, I was talking in Lille in uh, France uh, at the Global Roundtable on Sustainable Soy. And it was uh, backed by WWF, the panda lady again. And what's the panda lady saying? She's saying, if you're going into that fast chicken chain, then make sure that you really know what's behind the meat, egg and cheese that you are about to eat. Make sure you ask, who produced this chicken? How did they produce this chicken? Where did they produce this chicken? What did they feed it? Where did the feed come from? Did the feed come from Brazil, for example? Did it have any impact on the, uh, the Amazon? This is huge. And it, you can just see these social pressures dictating choice rising and rising. And I think of it in terms of remind me again what I can't eat. What do I have to feel guilty about it? Anything with palm oil as an ingredient, for example, because of the orangutans. Chicken that's been fed soy from Brazil. Chicken that's been kept in a natural, so not free range. Uh, shrimps caught by slave labor in Asia. Uh, and New Zealand won't use Thai shrimp because of concerns about slave labor. Eggs from chicken and judges. Beef that's destroyed the Amazon. Pork from hogs contained in store. Anything with GMOs. Anything in a non-recyclable pack, etc. And I think we just have to look at our industries and say, where are the touch points for us? Where are we likely to take some hammer? Can we get ahead of the game? And what is certain is that consumers around the world want to be able to see down that supply chain. Not every day, but they want traceability and they want transparency. And one way or another, technology will help them in this regard. Of course, we have blockchain. It doesn't have to be blockchain, but this is just an example of Carrefour uh, working with Nestle. Um, but it's, it's that... And, but here's a, an interesting example of it. So Kind, Kind is a snack bar, which is actually co-owned by Mars, uh, but the principal owner is still uh, the, the entrepreneur who, who launched it. And their focus is on nutritious snack bars. So here we have, here's the ingredients, 
apples, strawberries, cherries, etc. None of those ingredients are frightening. And in fact, they use this as a key point when they advertise the company. Ingredients you can see and pronounce. And when I look at that and when I look at the ingredient list, I just look at our products, you know, look at eggs, look at chicken. I'd say, you know, if I was in this, on every pack of eggs, I'd put ingredients, eggs. And on chicken, I'd put ingredients, chicken. That's it, nothing else. Make a big point. We don't shout hard enough about it. So from a consumer point of view, they want authentic food products. It's really, and they want simple food products. And they want brands that immerse themselves in the story. And they like to know where it comes from because that origin gives reassurance of quality and, and, and safety. And then I noticed something else, the big food, like the big food companies of the world, many of them US based for head offices, have taken a real drubbing over the last, what, five, seven years? And they've had to race to get any traction with new products. And they've been well beaten by nimble, just creative, innovative startups, often from entrepreneurs that come from outside the food industry. And they're trying to reconnect with food consumers. And I think that's a big thing in terms of over consumers are reconnecting with food. They want to know more about it. And I see here's just an example of this move. You see it increasingly towards regenerative ag, regenerative agriculture, or regen as it's sometimes done. Now, what is it exactly? I mean, who knows? I mean, from my sort of simple perspective, it's sort of leaving the land in a better position, better condition than when we started. But big food and regenerative agriculture is becoming big time. And I think there are opportunities for us here. Here's General Mills and Hormel. Uh, regenerative agriculture for dairy. Danone leads an alliance with the great ingredients company, DSM. Um, what's next? I was working uh, a couple of months ago in Europe with Barilla, which is one of the great pasta makers. It's an Italian firm. Here's the CEO who was, by the way, an ex Formula One driver. And they've made a huge switch towards this whole sustainability, sustainable ag, regenerative move. They want to deal with fewer people, fewer suppliers. They want clubs. They want those who understand the values that they stand for. And the week that I was doing it, for example, the Berilla spaghetti down the left-hand side. Here's the ad, bags of goodness, not bags of plastic. They were celebrating that their packaging at last was completely recyclable. So this sort of move towards sustainability isn't greenwash. It's way more than that. And it presents huge opportunities, I would suggest, for poultry and for eggs. And actually a leader in the whole sustainability race, if you will, for my mind was Unilever. Uh, through Paul Polman, its previous CEO, but now with its, uh, its, its, its more recent uh, CEO, Unilever's sustainable brands are the fastest growing parts of its business. And Danone is on the same wagon too. Here's Unilever saying, we'll sell off brands that hurt plant the planet or society. We'll dispose of brands that don't stand for something that means something to society and to consumers. You know, that's, that's tough talk. Uh, and I think we're starting to see that in the meat industry too. I was interested to note that what last week that uh, Tyson Foods advancing alternatives to meat. Tyson Foods sets up sustainable protein coalition and essentially say, what are we producing under this protein umbrella? And how can we ensure that it's great for the environment? It's a good start. And is it greenwashed? I don't think so. Because in the US, sustainably marketed products are only 16% of the market overall but they delivered more than half of the market growth. They just make good business sense. And what's more, the finance industry is into this here. Here's Pepsi issuing one billion in green bond to fund its sustainability initiatives. The, an Australian bank puts animal welfare criteria into its lending practices. Uh, more particularly, Credit Suisse, Lombard Odia, launches sustainable consumer fund. And the fund focuses on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, all 12 of them, responsible, particularly, sorry, particularly the 12th one, responsible consumption and production. And here in Canada, Maple Leaf Foods, the number one food company in Canada, arguably, and the Bank of Montreal entering to the first sustainably linked loan in Canada. And so what's this? They say that the Bank of Montreal is saying, if you hit 
these points relating to our concerns about the environment, animal welfare, uh, worker, uh, local economy, etc., then we'll structure a better deal for you in finance. This is real stuff. So here's some conclusions to consider. I've rammed it on. Look, hurrah, global demand for protein is growing fast with poultry and eggs leading the charge. It's great. Asia and Africa are the fastest growing markets. That's where the people are and that's where the incomes are increasing. The plant-based phenomenon is main market, not niche market, and it will take market share from livestock and fish proteins, but poultry and eggs are better placed than red meat. Climate-friendly diets are firmly on trend, and here there are opportunities and threats for poultry and eggs. Convenience, as I've said, trumps health. Create meal snack solutions, not problems. Nutri and enviro labeling is approaching fast, and that's driven by both governments and the private sector. There are social issues associated with food productions and their mounting importance. The proportion of these sort of eco-actives are increasing as population and income increases. Regen agriculture is fast becoming embraced by big food. It's an attractive concept for consumers, consider it. Sustainability is now a starting point for business, putting society and consumer wants before profits. It builds trust with consumers and increasingly it delivers improved sales and profits. And look, the green bar, like a high jump bar, the green bar is rising. That is, consumers' expectations of their food producers is increasing inexorably. It's not so much you get a price premium, unfortunately, for getting over the bar, it's more you get a price discount for not doing so. Clearly, there are great challenges, but there are huge opportunities for poultry and eggs, and I wish you well for the rest of the conference. And thanks very much for listening.